Hello guys, welcome to our today uh, talk. We will try to introduce you into a world of a purple teaming, which we find very interesting, and a future of uh, computer security and, uh, and the company's security. My name is Pavel Kordos, and today with my friend Patrick. Hello. We will uh, try to show you some, some basics about purple teaming. Then we will go through a simple purple exercise, uh, so you can understand uh, how it works, uh, both sides, and in the end we'll have some, probably have some conclusions together. All right, so uh, let's start, and the first let's let's define actually what is a uh, purple thing. But before doing that, uh, we first need to know, and probably you already know, the two teams, the red team and the blue team. Let's start from the offensive one, the red one, and what actually red teaming gives you Gives to your company. What does it really mean give you to your company? A report. A report. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So usually your team gives you a report, uh, but actually it's dived more into the technical part. So uh, as a result of a pen teaming, this is not a penetration test. Uh, red teaming is a process when you try to uh, simulate uh, bad guys at, uh, scenarios, how they work, follow the techniques, and try to identify the weakest spots in your organization. But actually, during this exercise, you will not have a comprehensive view about your current company situation. You will not have a complex list of uh, weaknesses and all the vulnerabilities. As a result, you probably will, you will have some kind of a path how the attacker can get into your network, how they can uh, perform lateral movement, what data can actually access, and so on and so on. And as a result, you have this fancy report, which we uh, have been laughing about uh, a few minutes uh, before that. Uh, but this report actually is only a path which was used by uh, an attacker, or at least uh, by a testers. But actually, may not give you may not give you a full scope about the security of your organization. Uh, Another story, someone who probably should protect your company. Those are the blue team guys. Blue team guys mostly associated, associated with guys which are just clicking on alerts but they do more uh, than that first <laughs> they try to observe uh, the current company situation they look for the logs and they should probably have a wide scope they should follow uh, their uh, the data sources they should uh, track malicious activities but this is not an easy task First of all, uh, doing blue team is uh, complicated because you got a lot of alerts. And for those of you who have seen an alert, alerts from uh, any uh, monitoring tool like a, a Casual Sentinel or Kibana, you probably know that you count them within uh, millions. Yeah, millions or at least hundreds of thousands records. Some of the tool, they actually gives you some kind of a hint uh, what's really suspicious and what's, uh, what, what's not so serious. But sometimes those suggestions they are not perfect, like uh, like we uh, like here we go uh, remote code execution attempt. I would probably consider it at least high. Maybe maybe this is one particular example, not so uh, so malicious, but those kind of issues they probably should be treated with the highest priority. And without proper understanding of those uh, issues, you probably will be very keen to just ignore them or just uh, click on them all right approved go on so go on and, uh, and go on so this is the the first issue uh, so maybe you should jump into a uh, documentation of the software maybe you can look for additional information here but hey look this is uh, an official microsoft documentation which ab about the pass the hash attack and pass the hash attack is a pretty serious one but let's look uh, bottom there we got official information if the hash was used from the computers used regularly close the alert as false positive well i agree that this probably doesn't mean that this particular station has been hacked but i wouldn't consider that uh, as that easy to trigger to mark as false positive probably you should investigate more and look uh, more into details so you can be sure that there are no uh, guests within your network and we got those two teams first we got the red team then we got a blue team 
and they have uh, different success measures. Like the red team success is to uh, find the path to probably, probably compromise your domain to exfiltrate the data, maybe steal some cash and so on. And when they actually uh, have a success, well, that's great. Blue team, uh, what's the success for blue team? Well, they see everything, they see pretty much everything. They probably got some alerts, which is great. Uh, they may find something which is more or less severe. And this is still a success, but none of these uh, is actually your company's success. Because when a blue team uh, has got a successful project, well, that's probably sad because there is a path which attacker can follow. If a blue team has, uh, has a success, that's great, but it may not give you a proper level of actually uh, of, a, of a secure. So, is there anything we could do about it uh, to make sure that our company is really safe and that those two teams can utilize their knowledge, their tools, just to make sure that you are actually improving your level of security? Well, in fact, there is at least an idea. Uh, it's called a purple teaming. So purple teaming is a, a hybrid solution between red team and the blue team. Uh, they are working together. They can those two teams can be separate. They can be separate like physical separate teams, or they can be uh, like uh, working together uh, for a short period of time. You can also have a dedicated purple team. It doesn't really matter. It's all about the work schema, not the actual actual human organization. And the, because of that, because of knowledge over teaming, how to actually attack the company and the uh, knowledge of the blue team how you can actually see something malicious within your company you can combine those two knowledges and as a result maybe really improve your level of security and you can actually address the real issues and the real uh, paths that attackers follow and you can be sure that on, on one side red team can or cannot launch some kind of uh, tool or perform some kind of attack and from the other perspective we can see whether the blue team actually sees that if not maybe they can they can use their fancy tools to uh, go through locks they can tune them uh, and check what they can do to actually see uh, an attacker all right this uh, this is relatively uh, easy to tell <laughs> in, in, in fact uh, we can now go to something practical, we will show you how it can be really performed and this will be led by, by Patrick. Patrick, over to you. Thanks. So to uh, wrap up what Pavel said, uh, red teaming is uh, not quite a pen test, however it may look like this, but this is a scenario-based, goal-oriented exercise uh, targeted at uh, some crown jewels of the organization and the red teamers try to show the shortest or easiest or uh, most visible attack path to compromise the company. While blue team existed uh, long before red teams and they were, weren't were called by colors, uh, I think the blue is some addition to, to the offensive guys being red teams. Uh, the combination is called purple team or purple teaming. And during uh, this this talk we would want to go to a practical exercise of purple teaming to show you what that's really about. So we'll start with uh, analyzing a malicious document, malicious do word document with a macro to see uh, an example attack path to map uh, actual TTPs leveraged by this malicious document and to, to map them to my true attack framework. Then, based on those CTPs, we will plan a simulation scenario, develop uh, simulations for, for those specific CTPs, and then execute them in a controlled environment, and finally we will try to, to detect the malicious activity using uh, elastic stack. Let me interrupt you for a second, but is this, uh, this macro issue can it be some kind of uh, ATP group, uh, APT group uh, attack scenario? Is it a real world one or rather the lab one? I think it's a lab one because we, we don't have time to dissect a, a serious, seriously obfuscated stuff. So we prepared some some uh, rather simple document just to to show uh, some malicious techniques used in that, and uh, this would be easy to to dissect in in few minutes to to actually extract those uh, relevant entities from from this <coughs> piece of code.
All right, let's go. Okay, so we have uh, some kind of malicious macro. Let's see how it does exactly here. Let me to zoom in a little bit. So first we have some variables, then some uh, some hex data, as we can see, and then this is uh, decoded with XOR encoding and and uh, with hex encoding, and the password is seen here cl clearly. So the, let's say this document is a little bit deobfuscated by us initially, so it's easier to read. And let's see what it does here. So first uh, we have some URL, then uh, XML HTTP object is created uh, to issue an uh, HTTP request, probably to download some stuff, and then this stuff is saved to, to a disk. So maybe let's let the decrypt those suspicious uh, strings. So the first one is a URL to invoke Kerberos tool. So, so this tool is downloaded and then uh, saved using the, the second uh, variable, which is a path to, to disk. And this file is, is then saved on disk. So that's the fir first part of this macro. So we can uh, here identify some TTPs. So first is data obfuscation. Uh, second one is, is uh, data download, ma malicious uh, tools downloading. And the third one is dropping uh, a file to disk. And then uh, see what, what's going on uh, next. Before we go, we go before we go further, maybe Patrick, you can uh, just uh, briefly describe why it is important to uh, just maybe uh, divide the code within the, into a smaller pieces, those TTPs. Why it is important? What it gives us? What ability? Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll go to that, but uh, it's just uh, about uh, splitting the malicious uh, actions into atomics, so uh, an undividable actions to, to simulate each one and to train uh, prevention detections uh, on for, for, for this, those specific techniques. So we can uh, split this uh, macro, which is a set of TTPs, into some basic TTPs, which is, for example, file download, some, some malicious encoding, some process creation, etc. And then uh, test each one of them to see if we can uh, detect this malicious activity. And later, for example, if we can correlate uh, some some actions uh, to to find the uh, actual attack but now we are focusing on on very uh, atomic stuff here it also gives us a great ability to tune our detection uh, resources because if we will treat uh, this let's say macro as a one single big object we probably won't be able to catch everything but if we take a look at uh, it as a uh, series of actions like a smaller actions first let's maybe download the macro second drop the file on disk then run something then run something again then run something different then maybe launch some program within a specific um a pa a parent process we'll go about it a little later uh, it it gives us a great ability to properly tune our the, our detection tools uh, you will see about it later today yeah, that's right. So going further with the macro, here we have uh, some actually com object instantiation, and it's called by by its CLS ID, and this is called share browser window here, and this object uh, allows us to execute some shell command. So uh, the thing with com objects is that uh, they can have some specific methods shared or uh, specific parts, let's say, uh, fields of those objects can, can have other fields and they can have uh, specific methods. So with this shell browser window, we have a sub-object called document, then another object uh, nested called application, and then this application object have a, a shell execute method, which uh, requires some parameters. Uh, here is a process name, here are parameters, and uh, we can see some base64 encoded stuff uh, going uh, to be executed by PowerShell and uh, working directory and uh, information to, to hide the window or not. So it's not hidden here, but uh, an attacker would obviously hide this, this window so it won't be visible. PowerShell encoded command probably looks suspicious for us. 
we can make a note on that and we'll go, go back to this a little later. Yeah, sure. So uh, actually we can try to, to see what, what's in this command here, leveraging Cybershaft again. So after uh, decoding this and uh, decoding with, with specific encoding for Windows, which is UTF-16, we can see some, some PowerShell script here. So what it does is to bypass anti-malware scripting interface with some, some clever method, which is called uh, MC init failed. And then it uh, executes our script, which was down downloaded to, to disk and then uh, invokes this uh, invo Kerberos function. Why you just want to use a one-liner for that? Well, <laughs> this would be blocked by uh, MC itself, so uh, this MC by bypass. That, that, that's, the, that's the antivirus evasion pro tip, if you want to make a note, you can just make a note uh, right now. Yes, so so that's, that's uh, some clever technique and it's also obfuscated because if we try to use this MSI bypass in uh, one line, it's uh, it gets blocked by by the MSI. So we would need to split those in in few lines. So uh, each line would be executed uh, after another, and then this won't be blocked by the anti-malware scripting interface. So then we could easily in execute the invoke Kerberos script because without this uh, MSI bypass, this uh, would be blocked. So. That's some simple uh, yet clever technique to bypass MSI uh, here and execute the, the Kerberos attack. Everybody loves Kerberos thing. <laughs> sure. So, uh, this is it for the macro. These are uh, helper functions for Zor uh, encryption decryption and, and hex decoding, which were used uh, here. So, to, to wrap up, the macro downloads uh, some file, saves save this to disk, and uh, execute the the PowerShell command while bypassing anti-malware scripting interface. And of course, the data is is decoded here, so it's not uh, visible at the first sight well, what's exactly going on here. So, so, so for those of you who understand this piece of code, you can actually make a little challenge for yourself. You can try to count how many particular TTPs we will be able to actually simulate in a uh, in a few seconds. So a few uh, a few seconds for you to, to count to count them, and we will go with this in a second. All right, and we are back. Uh, the little challenge is over, and those are the TTPs which you probably uh, have been able to identify, or if not yet, you will do in a few seconds. Uh, so, uh, Patrick, maybe you can. Yes. Yeah, so them. to wrap up, what we have identified uh, while analyzing this malicious document. Uh, first of all. Uh, some assumption here that this was delivered by uh, phishing, so it could have been delivered as a spur phishing attachment to a user. No one thought about that, right? Because it somehow, uh, somehow it should it, it need to be delivered, right? So th this macro has to somehow land on the employees or user workstation. So this is the, actually the first TTP which we can see there. Yeah, so the second one would be actual execution of the file by a user, for example, tricked by some fancy message in, in, in the email. Anyway, user executed the, the file and we all would try to simulate this part. Uh, and going to, to some more specific TTPs, uh, first of all, we noticed PowerShell execution, Visual Basic, of course, the VBA macro itself. Uh, another thing is obfuscated information in the file, so, so those base64 strings and hex encoded data. Uh, Interprocess communication, and this is about the usage of COM objects. Impairing defenses, uh, so this MSI bypass we've seen, this tricky one. And uh, the last one is uh, actually what the, the PowerShell script does. So this is a Kerberos tick attack, so this falls into a category of stealing or forging Kerberos tickets. What are those T numbers on the left side? Because we use those T1566, what are these? Yeah, so the, the, this is just a mapping to, to Mitra attack ma matrix, which is a common, let's say, common language for, for what we do for purple teams, but also red teams and blue teams, so this is a some categor cool categorization of typical uh, attacker adver adversarial techniques and tactics yeah this ma this matrix uh, 
just divides all of the uh, different uh, layers of attack in, into a smaller pieces. So if you previously uh, didn't have a chance to uh, go through that, we highly recommend that because it's it's some kind of industry standard for that. All right, so we got the TTPs. Let's maybe do something a little more technical now and try to plan our simulation, which we'll do in a few seconds. Yes, sure. So uh, going through all those identified TTPs, let's talk about how we could actually simulate them to, to see if our environment could be protected from, from those specific uh, atomic attacks or if we can uh, detect them. So the first thing is uh, the mentioned spear fishing attachment. So we could uh, simulate this, for example, by bombing a mail gateway with some malicious documents generated by a tool. Uh, and there are a lot of open source tools for, for that available on GitHub. So for example, every Clippy, Microshop, Lucky Strike, and tens of others. Uh, second, TTP was actual f malicious file execution by the user. So let's simulate this by just uh, dropping the malicious document on the disk. Uh, third one is, is PowerShell. So we have we have actual two simulations here. First is PowerShell with encoded commands, which is very, very typical for for adversaries for some malicious actions uh, originating from macro or other scripts and uh, another thing is PowerShell downloading a file from the web so we will simulate here how is it lo does it look like uh, if PowerShell is downloading some data from the internet and how can we detect this uh, for Visual Basic we'll try to simulate a word application spawning PowerShell process because that's how uh, some macros work and uh, that's some uh, cool indicator when the PowerShell process or CMD process is created by Word or Excel. That's not very typical, so so probably associated with some kind of attack. So let's see if we can detect this. Uh, obfuscated uh, data. This would be simulated by by this PowerShell encoded commands. So this will cover the uh, obfuscation. Com objects uh, will simulate creating an instance of com object and using this to execute some commands in PowerShell. Impairing defenses, so we'll simulate the MSI bypass just as it was done in, a, in this malicious macro. And then uh, Kerberos thing, so instead of uh, using the invoke Kerberos script, we could dive a little deeper and see how, how this works. So Actually, Kerberos thing attack is just uh, requesting uh, TGS tickets and we can use the .NET uh, class called Kerberos Requester Security Token for that and it's this is just how exactly the invoke Kerberos tool works. So just a little remark from uh, from me today, we will focus only on the uh, on the uh, seven, seven techniques. We will not cover today the phishing one uh, because we would like only show you the the, the most more technical uh, the part, but actually don't forget about this the, the, this phishing and this like gateway monitoring or any other internet activity monitoring. This is also useful. Uh, we will not do this uh, today, and today we will also uh, want to cover uh, the, the PowerShell downloading the file from the web because it could be the, done within uh, different layers, which we will describe uh, uh, in a few minutes. But uh, this is also uh, those network sources, the, like a gateway and uh, and a mail uh, system. They can also be a source for for, for your uh, blue team and for your detection tools. Uh, so don't forget about about that. All right. So we got a plan. Let's now uh, develop it and use our uh, tools to do that. Sure, so this is my favorite part of the whole group mm -hmm. teaming concept. So, and and uh, the most interesting one, I think. So, for, for those simulations, uh, for dropping a malicious document on the disk, we can just simulate this by dropping some, some malicious file on the disk and see if it gets locked and how can we do with that later. Encoded commands, uh, it's uh, simple also, so 
just run PowerShell, create PowerShell process with, with parameters of base64 encoded command. And simulating a web activity, we can leverage invoke web request command left for that. For uh, testing, uh, simulating Word application spawning PowerShell, we can use some some simple uh, VBA code, which just uh, executes PowerShell. For com objects, we can create instance of the same object that was used in this malicious macro from PowerShell, and then use this to execute some some process. See how how it looks like in logs. Uh, MSI bypass is just uh, the same one liner, but uh, actually in one line, which was used in uh, in the malicious document. So we will use this for simulation, and for Kerber roasting, we will uh, issue a single uh, TGS request to to the domain controller to to see how this is logged. So please keep in mind that those P, those, those code pieces, they come directly from the macro which we shown you uh, before, and they have been uh, separated. So we can observe the each level. We will not just run macro and see do, uh, does it work? Do we see anything? We just uh, split that within uh, smaller pieces, so we can uh, step by step see each step, each uh, each step of execution, like. Uh, first uh, dropping file, then running, uh, then object uh, um, uh, initialization, and then some script launching. So we each of these uh, particular steps can be observed, or maybe cannot, uh, we will see that, uh, but probably can, uh, can be observed, and uh, that, so, that beca because we, d we divide it uh, into that smaller pieces, we can see actually more than uh, just run this macro and see oh, do we have any connection or run it in a sandbox and oh I don't have any IP then the file is, uh, is secure. So uh, we got these uh, code pieces directly from the previously shown macro. And now the lab time, the favorite one. Sure. So actually, not not everything is just copied and pasted from from the macro. Some are uh, are different, but try to simulate similar behavior. And one particular example is simulation four. Actually, when we used this uh, com object to spawn PowerShell process, the parent would be Explorer, not uh, the WinWorld, but using this uh, basic shell command of VBA uh, to spawn uh, another process uh, the parent for for powershell uh, spawned uh, via the method in simulation 4 would be winword.exe it was a spoiler spoiler alert <laughs> sorry <laughs> all right let's go to the lab and welcome back to our very simple uh, purple teaming uh, virtual lab uh, today we will use uh, Kibana, which will support us uh, within a, a, a log investigation, and this very uh, very simple app uh, consists of one workstation, which is actually a domain controller, but doesn't really matter. We are interesting about the results, not the particular uh, particular machines. So, uh, as you remember, we identified 70 TPs, and the first one is actually dropping a file on a disk, uh, and we will do that, uh, but. Uh, Dropping this file isn't a job for antivirus. Why? Are, why we actually are interested uh, in logging that? Yeah, sure. So uh, let's imagine uh, some malicious document is dropped uh, on on a disk. So this is, as Pavel mentioned, the job for antivirus or, or some EDR. So this would be immediately blocked, if not properly obfuscated uh, to to bypass antiviruses. But uh, and also uh, we cannot uh, create an alerts based on, on file creation I think because there are lots of events like that but uh, anyway if possible we could uh, log those file creations for for later uh, reference for example while investigating some some incident uh, during the incident response process we could go back to this data and, and see that uh, at specific time a file was dropped in let's say downloads folder and then a few minutes later it was executed and, and one minute later this word process created PowerShell process and then this was followed by some malicious activities so this event of f 
file creation of this could uh, may be helpful for such an investigation for us. So actually, the more you log, the better. Uh, it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really mean that the more you have in your tool, the better. Uh, it's all about properly tuning this tool to exfiltrate what actually is important for you from the other, uh, let's say, background noise. Uh, but logging that, as Patrick said, could be uh, useful for any kind of forensics to actually see what happened, uh, because we can uh, go back and follow follow uh, the, 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 the attacker's path. And as simple as that, uh, we are able to use our event ID parameter in inside of our uh, of the Kibana tool. And just using event ID 11, we got eight hits within the last actually 10 minutes because this is a, this is the time the lab is, is working. And let's have a look uh, inside one of uh, these these logs. And as we see, this file sample uh, doc file was just uh, dumped in a secret location on my desktop. But anyway, it gives us ability to follow the execution path and maybe support our forensic, uh, forensic activity. It does, it's, it's, this is not connected with uh, scanning it inside of antivirus solutions because this is a different story, but uh, for uh, analyzing, this is also a great knowledge source. And to also worth noting that this is Sysmon event ID 11, which is uh, file creation here. Yeah, all right. You can also you can also tune uh, tune Kibana to have alert on that, but probably having alert on each particular file <laughs> could be uh, could be could be a tremendous uh, to to go through. But uh, even without alerting, we are able to uh, to uh, go back and see what happened inside of our machine. All right. So uh, let's go to the second TTP, which we previously identified, and this second TTP would be PowerShell with encoded command. So we're gonna launch uh, that on our machine, and this is very basic who am I uh, command, uh, as you probably see. And if we will now go to our Kibana tool, we can filter those kind of and the, those kind of requests. Uh, for this, we used first the event ID, which is process creation, and then we looked for the process name, which was, as you remember, PowerShell, and we got a couple of hits. And this one is uh, pretty much, pretty much it. Uh, very catchy eye will probably notice that uh, Kibana has already have this rule name. This is not something which Kibana gives you by default. It actually comes from a Sysmon, uh, from a package called Sysmon Modular, and you can actually manipulate that. This, those are some uh, predefined uh, rule techniques. So don't stick on that yet. Uh, but it actually, kind of match our. Uh, our situation now, but if we will uh, browse to the bottom, there is something which we will be probably interested in. And first, we see that there is this process PowerShell, uh, uh, PowerShell, and above you see that this PowerShell has been launched with encoded command parameter. And if, for example, you would like to uh, tune your Kibana tool. To capture those kind of uh, those kind of TPs, you probably may want to have it a little more detailed. So in this particular case, you can also add some regular expression to this parameter process command line, just to ca to to capture only uh, uh, those uh, encoded command executions. All right, uh, simple uh, simple as this. Uh, then the third one, which is actually a PowerShell downloading a file from a web, but uh, just like we uh, we uh, said before, we will not focus today on the networking part. Uh, this, of course, could be also launched and could be visible from uh, it's, it's a Google it's a Google uh, it could be visible uh, as a network activity depending on which technique you actually use or maybe not you but the attacker will use there can be like a different uh, artifacts for that but just like we said we won't focus on the uh, networking uh, network, networking part right now all right, and uh, TTP number four, uh, we will uh, spawn PowerShell uh, from a uh, windward, and this could be uh, done, of course, from a malicious macro, this particular line. Yeah, so to simulate this TTP, we could just simply create a Word document and 
put this uh, one line in macro so when executed the world would spawn a powershell process and uh, if launched uh, we can uh, see if we if we, if, we, if we are able to capture that and to do that we can uh, look for uh, parent process name which in our case if we will just scroll to the to the bottom uh, we can spot oh, apologies lab is not always the dynamic as it looks all right uh, so in this case we got this parent process name which is winworld and if we look just above we see that the process actually is powershell so it means that uh world is actually spawning a powershell which is definitely not the behavior you would, you would expect in a regular working environment right no so. that's not <laughs> like some office uh, office work yeah. Even even if you uh, use macro, you pro you probably <laughs> won't be launching PowerShell from macro. So this is a pretty good indicator that some malicious macro has been uh, has been launched. And you can correlate those two kind of activities and have alert uh, and see those kind of uh, those kind of uh, things. All right, uh, the simulation number five, the com object. Okay, so uh, this is actually what was done in in the macro, and as I mentioned. Uh, spawning a process using this com object and uh, shell execute function uh, would give a parent uh, of explorer.exe so uh, the par parent of the cmd would be explorer and parent for notepad would be cmd here and we see that the empty notepad has been launched let's look into our kibana if we are able to see that By the way, if you want to have like a very quick uh, uh, query to just verify for the uh, for the particular TTP, it's always great to have those set queries uh, for the future. If you have uh, some parameters which you'd like to filter, it's very useful. Like I use in the moment, we have a couple of predefined queries, which uh, really improves uh, improves our our work. And in this case, we will uh, we will observe. Uh, First, first the uh, event ID, and let's go to the bottom. We see that we are actually able to uh, to spot our uh, our part of macro. Sure. So it's it's easy to spot here because it was executed in a single line, and we can in in this uh, single event we can see everything that was executed, but. I don't think it's it's that easy to to uh, spot a com object creation. So for 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 this, we would need to dive deep into logs, for example, for PowerShell logs here, but, but because I don't think that com object instantiation is uh, locked uh, just like that. All right, and your uh, pro tip for our viewers: how to disable. Um, uh, I'm sorry, and let's try to disable that. I just hope the defender is already off. Yeah, it's off. And as you can see, it it worked. Let's check whether we are able to see that in our Kibana. So one thing about uh, enabling or, or disabling antivirus. So here we, we disable defender to just purely focus on detections, but uh, while assessing the environment. Uh, uh, specifically preventions, uh, we would uh, leave uh, any such solutions uh, on. So, for example, we would see that uh, this uh, particular technique was blocked by Defender, by the MSI itself, but uh, now we are focusing purely on detection, so we just uh, uh, removed the, the Defender from the equation and we can focus uh, on, on what's being logged here. Yeah, and we see we get a hit. We uh, have our uh, our function right there, and this is a great example. Why why just like you shown before, if we will use split that command with uh, within the multiple lines, if uh, for example some blue team will have a regular expression for that particular query, if you will just uh, make a few lines and uh, not a one liner, regular expression will probably not catch that. That easy. So this is this is this is actually the pretty pretty uh, tricky part. Uh, but uh, as you can see, you are able to to do that. Uh, this is also uh, a great example why you actually perform a blue team because uh, in most cases you probably will just launch that, uh, launch that, and check whether do you see that. 
Is it so often that you uh, uh, see what you expect to see in your monitoring tool, Patrick? Do you think? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. So it's always great to uh, to launch that, see whether our detection capabilities are good enough to see everything. If not, make some tuning, redo the, the, the test, make some tuning, redo the test, and so on and so on. Once you are satisfied with the results, so you have a very good example. Of, uh, this is a very good example for uh, this uh, this particular, like the essence of the purple team. All right, and uh, the last one, the Kerberos thing. So, as we mentioned before, we could uh, simulate the Kerberos thing attack with uh, this invoke Kerberos tool or script. But uh, what we can also do is dive deeper into the script itself and see that uh, it uh, issues just a raw TGS request using this Kerberos request and security token class of .NET and use this to, to simulate the activity. And that's uh, that's also the this essence of purple teaming that Pavel mentioned just a second ago. Uh, we can start our attack simulations from from the simplest, most obvious techniques. And for example, the invoke Kerberos tool could be detected just by uh, monitoring executed commands. But a more cl clever attacker would uh, perform uh, Kerberos thing using this tool, but maybe renamed, so it won't be just called invoke Kerberos, but some, let's say invokes something non-malicious. So the, the simplest uh, detections would fail. And uh, going further, advancing our offensive and also defensive cap capabilities further, we could uh, simulate the Kerberos thing uh, by executing TGS requests in a longer ti time periods because the invoke Kerberos tool just uh, issues those requests one after another and the monitoring could uh, cut this easily because there would be like 10 or 20 or more requests for, for TGS tickets in, in short time period so this uh, could be definitely uh, some alert for that but uh, a clever attacker would uh, simulate or, or execute Kerber roasting in, in longer time, time periods for example one TGS request, then to wait a uh, few minutes and another request and so on. So this uh, simple correlation would would not see the, the Kerberos thing attack performed in this longer time frame. So advancing the offensive capability, we would uh, need to advance our detections to, to actually catch, the, catch this attack. So in our case, we just used a very simple event ID filter. We just uh, filtered the particular event ID. And for those of you who are familiar with the Kerber Roasting, there are some kind of uh, specific things when it comes to Kerber Roasting you can actually spot on. And one of which is the ticket encryption, which kind of differs when you perform a Kerber Roasting from the regular uh, ticket request. And you can also use that knowledge just to, uh, to spot that within your blocks. But also the, there's some tricky part with this encryption type and, and actually uh, Will Schroeder, uh, Hanjoy, did a, a great article on that on, on his blog and he just dove deep into how, how Kerber, Kerberos works and uh, the bottom line is it's not that easy to, to disable the default encryption of uh, RC, RC4 and uh, some some let's say legitimate TGS requests could, could also use the, this type of encryption. But uh, for Kerber hosting specifically, we we would uh, need to use uh, RC4 encryption uh, to crack those tickets faster. All right, and we are back to the uh, PowerPoint, and uh, we've finished our lab. We've performed a couple of great activities, and as you've seen, we will we were able to find pretty much everything. Uh, we, Of course, this is a very simplified scenario because uh, within uh, our lab environment, you probably won't have this background noise, which will, which will be a, a big uh, headwind for all of this uh, purple teamers and blue teamers just to exfiltrate the proper, uh, proper things out from the logs. So maybe, Patrick, you can wrap up what we actually did to detect our... Sure, so, so let's go through all of the scenarios and if First is dropping the motion document on the disk. So as we mentioned, uh, just a good antivirus could could catch this. But if the file is let's, let's say properly obfuscated, this won't be enough. So 
uh, Blue Team would need some, some file creation events for uh, incident response or threat hunting purposes. Uh, the second one was uh, PowerShell with, with encoded command. So uh, here we could uh, leverage some tricky regular expression to catch uh, such uh, invocations of PowerShell. And one thing to note here, it's enough actually to put the minus E parameter without the whole encoded command part. And then this is base64 encoded stuff, because that's how PowerShell works. So it could be either minus E or minus enc encoded or whatever. Uh, the third thing is network connectivity, so this could be logged by some firewall, IDS, IPS inside your network, or also by, by Sysmon, which logs network connections and also the process uh, from which the connection originates, that, that can be also useful. Uh, fourth scenario is uh, executing spawning PowerShell process from, from uh, Word or Excel or similar application, so for that we would uh, check the Sysmon event 1 or Windows event uh, number 4688 and the thing with Windows event uh, is that I think from Windows 10 the actual parent process name is logged but before the on, only the parent process ID was logged so the ID is, is not uh, very useful for the analysis, we would need the, the whole Parent process name to see this, see what was going on actually. Uh, fifth thing uh, was the com object instantiation. So here we, if this was done by PowerShell, we could leverage the PowerShell scri script block logging and, for example, grab for the specific uh, CLS ID associated with the shell browser window com object. And MSI bypass, this is tricky one uh, when executed by this one liner. Firstly, it would be blocked by the MSI itself, but uh, when uh, it comes to detections, we could also block for, uh, we could also filter logs for MSI or um, MSI init failed or something like that to maybe catch such, such events, such commands executed. And the last thing is, is Kerber hosting, so the <coughs> most relevant uh, event ID for Kerber hosting is, is uh, those associated with, with the ticket creation, ticket re requests. Alright, and that was pretty much everything we have prepared uh, for you today. One last word from us, uh, if you are seeking for additional knowledge, there are a couple of great, great frameworks to follow when it comes to purple teaming, one of which the uh, most known, I guess, is the Atomic uh, Protecting Framework, right? Uh, it gives a great ability to perform such a, uh, actions inside of your, in your environment. Actually, building your own uh, Purple Lab is not that tough. It's uh, just a uh, very, uh, very simple uh, Kibana to, to, to install one log machine, one domain controller, maybe has some kind of router in the network, and that's it. So uh, what we encourage you to do is actually to um, uh, try to apply it in your, inside your organization, see what actually do you see, if you don't see some, anything, tune your tools, uh, and redo the test, and redo the test. One final word from you, Patrick. Thanks for watching. Thanks I for guess. watching, and stay <laughs> healthy, of course. Hope you enjoy our presentation. Goodbye. Bye.